If you guys haven't realized it by now, Batman happens to be one of my favorite superheroes. And specifically, my favorite movie trilogy of all time happens to be Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight trilogy. Patrick Bateman is the best Batman! Now, Christopher Nolan's got a new movie coming out called Oppenheimer, starring, of course, Killian Murphy, who just happens to be the lead actor for one of my favorite TV series of all time, Peaky Blinders. So you could say I'm pretty excited for Christopher Nolan's upcoming movie, Oppenheimer. So in today's episode of Eddie where I bring the most interesting people, animal, and science videos on the internet, we're going to listen to the story of J. Robert Oppenheimer and how creating the atomic bomb destroyed his life. As Julius Robert Oppenheimer witnessed the successful detonation of the world's first nuclear weapon, he was haunted by its implications. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita, now I am become death the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that one way or another. That is one of my favorite lines of all time, and it's one that I think about quite often. As the famous line from Spider-Man goes, with great power comes great responsibility. And, well, if you unleash this kind of power, some people aren't gonna use it. But in his defense, both the Germans and the Russians were working on it simultaneously, so if the Americans hadn't been first, someone else would have done it. Oppenheimer was a man of many talents. He spoke eight languages, wrote poetry, yet he will forever be remembered as the father of the atomic bomb. Eight languages? That's actually extremely impressive. I have a lot of respect for people who are able to learn a bunch of languages. I know a couple, but that's only thanks to my parents, and it's really, really difficult for me to try to learn a new language. I've been living in Poland for like almost 10 years, and my Polish is so bad still. I'm trying, guys. I'm trying. The man who gave people the power to destroy themselves was haunted by his own creation. When people first met J. Robert Oppenheimer, what was immediately obvious to them was his intellect. A former colleague once said, the man was unbelievable. He always gave you the right answer before you formulated the question. Knowledge came easy to Oppenheimer. He learned Dutch in six weeks, just so he could give a lecture while on a visit to the Netherlands. All right, guys, we get it. He's a genius. He was born in New York on April 22, 1904, the older son of German Jewish immigrants. His father, Julius, was a textile importer who became very wealthy. His mother was a painter whose family had been in New York for generations. He was raised in Manhattan on the Upper West Side in an apartment adorned with paintings by famous artists, including Van Gogh. <clears throat> Tell me you're rich without telling me you're rich. After attending an elite private school in New York City, he went on to Harvard in 1922, intending to become a chemist, but leaving with an appetite for physics. He had been attracted to experimental physics after taking a course on thermodynamics at Harvard. He also studied philosophy, Greek, and French literature. He spent his days living in the library, raiding the place intellectually, as he put it. He enrolled at Harvard a year late due to suffering from colitis, an inflammatory bowel disease, but he made up for it by graduating in three years instead of four. I've got a lot of respect for anyone suffering from any kind of chronic illness. Man, those things suck. But if you're able to overcome that, you're definitely in a small percentage of the elite population. He then crossed the pond to the University of Cambridge to conduct research at the Cavendish Laboratory for Experimental Physics. However, he was clumsy in the lab and realized his forte was not in experimental work, but rather in theoretical physics. The stress of grad work threw him into depression, and he became emotionally unstable. He even confessed to lacing an apple with harmful chemicals in an attempt to poison his tutor, with whom he didn't get along. Fortunately, the tutor didn't eat the apple. So imagine being so much of a genius that they put you in all of the advanced classes. And then when they challenge you, you can't quite live up to their impossible standards. Yeah, that would probably make me go crazy too. Oppenheimer left Cambridge to continue his studies at one of the centers of theoretical physics in Europe, the University of Göttingen in Germany. He produced good work and held his own, despite his youth. He was only 23 years old when he received his PhD. Jeez, I mean, what were you guys doing at 23? I had also actually graduated university by then, so good for me. But damn, imagine having a PhD by then. Oof, not bad, Oppenheimer. He subsequently returned to the US where he worked as a research fellow at Harvard and then the California Institute of Technology, Caltech. 
He was so absorbed in his studies that he often ignored the real world. But the rise of fascism in Europe in the 1930s caught his attention. Oppenheimer agreed with Einstein that German scientists could make a nuclear weapon. And when they did, Hitler was prepared to use it. America watched fearfully as the Nazis invaded Poland in 1939 yeah, this is what I was saying. There was definitely an arms race going on at the time. People think about the Cold War as being the ultimate arms race, which I guess is true because it was when nukes just got like proliferated like crazy. But the amount of technology that was developed in World War II, I mean, we got computers, we got radar, we got airplanes, we got the Haber-Bosch process, which absolutely revolutionized farming because we were able to make fertilizer from the air. And all of that happened in the span of the World Wars. So when you think about the breadth of technological advancement, yeah, I'm gonna give that win to the World Wars instead of the Cold Wars. But uh, yeah, please no World War III, guys, please. We're close. In 1942, Oppenheimer was selected to direct the Manhattan Project, a top secret US Army project to develop the atomic bomb. He brought together the best minds in physics and eventually managed more than 3,000 people. He chose Los Alamos, New Mexico as a primary production facility because of its natural beauty. Hey, isn't Los Alamos also where Area 51 is? Mm, I'm not saying it's aliens, but it's aliens. He had fallen in love with the mountains and plateaus when he traveled there as a teen during his gap year as he recovered from ill health. Washington threw ridiculous amounts of money at the project. An initial budget of $6,000 eventually ballooned into a whopping two billion by 1945. I mean, yeah, if you have a weapon that can literally obliterate cities, which I mean, they knew that theoretically, but they weren't really sure. Like when they used them, people were kind of like, nah, they're not really gonna be that bad. Uh, they were worse than people imagined. But what I'm trying to say is when you have access to technology that's so much more powerful than your rivals, yeah, you gotta put everything you've got behind that. Before heading the Manhattan Project, Oppenheimer taught physics at both Caltech and the University of California, Berkeley, where he built the physics program and turned it into the hub for physics research in America. He had already been working on nuclear fission, the powerful release of energy caused by the splitting of an atom. The best element for splitting is the heaviest element found in nature, uranium. A uranium atom has 92 protons and 146 neutrons. Oh, we're getting into the science now. I hope you guys are ready to learn how to make a nuclear bomb. I am. <laughs> Giving an atomic mass of 238, or U-238. A small portion of uranium that's mined has the same 92 protons. However, it only has 143 neutrons, giving us U-235. This is highly unstable, which makes it highly splittable or fissionable. When it's slammed by a neutron, it becomes U-236. It's so unstable that it splits into two atoms, krypton and barium. Wait, 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 krypton's actually an atom? How did I not know that? I'm sure I knew that. I must have forgotten that at some point. Well, good thing I'm a sport of Batman and not Superman because, you know, not looking good for him. In the process, three more neutrons are released. They fly out and slam into more U-235 atoms, causing a chain reaction and ultimately a huge explosion. Ironically, the only one who would probably be able to save us from the nukes is Superman himself. All right, I'm a fan again. Bring Henry Cavill back. Kind of like when you throw a bowling ball and the pins jump and strike other pins and those pins smash into other pins, all of the energy is released. Research also showed that plutonium-239 would be highly fissionable. However, it's not a naturally occurring element and had to be manufactured. Reactors were built in southeastern Washington state to produce the plutonium. And then, on July 16, 1945, scientists detonated a plutonium bomb over the small town of Alamogordo, New Mexico. Well, it would be pretty awkward if you were living there at the time, and all of a sudden, you weren't. We knew the world would not be the same. Few people laughed. Few people cried, most people were silent. Never before had humanity possessed a weapon that posed a threat to human civilization. The test's success meant an atomic bomb was ready to be used by the US military. The following month, the US military dropped two atomic bombs on Japan. 
See, this is what happens when you mess with the LGBTQ+. They push back with a cheeky little boy and a fat man. On August 6, 1945, the most powerful weapon in the world was dropped on the Japanese city of Hiroshima. 140,000 people were killed, many vaporized. Thousands more would die in pain in the months and years that followed from radiation poisoning. Three days later, another bomb fell on Nagasaki, killing 74,000 people with equally devastating effects. Yeah, so I hope you guys get the point. These bombs were absolutely in Insane. Now, I actually did a video on someone who survived both of these nuclear bombs, which is really interesting. Check it out here. Japanese Emperor Hirohito decried the devastating power of a new and most cruel bomb. Japan surrendered six days later, abruptly ending World War II. This is what I mean. The second your enemy uses something that's so much more powerful than anything you have, you have no other option. You're like, yeah, man, all right, that's it. We're done. Thank you. Okay, do whatever you want with us. Crazy. Oppenheimer initially expressed guilt over his creation. He said the weapon had dramatized so mercilessly the inhumanity and evil of war. He continued, in some sort of crude sense, which no vulgarity, no humor, no overstatements can quite extinguish. The physicists have known sin, and this is a knowledge which they cannot lose. Yet a decade later, he appeared to distance himself from personal responsibility, pinning it on the state, saying, I carry no weight on my conscience. Our work has changed the conditions in which men live, but the use made of these changes is the problem of governments, not of scientists. Yeah, I think he gets the point there that like, if they hadn't done it, someone else would have. So at that point, it's like, we can choose between a bad situation and a worse situation. Well, then I might as well work towards making the situation as least bad as I can, which I guess he did. Well, yeah, if you thought therapists got excited when the blue haired girl full of tattoos walked in, just wait till they meet the physicist who worked on the Manhattan Project. P.S. If you're a goth girl with blue hair, you go girl, express yourself. After the war, he became a key advisor on US atomic policy. He headed the principal advisory committee of the successor to the Manhattan Project, the Atomic Energy Commission. The commission was a civilian agency in control of nuclear research and the development of nuclear weapons. He even had a desk in the president's executive offices across the street from the White House. Damn, yo! I mean, I guess it would make sense that the president would want to keep the creator of the atomic bomb quite close to home. Wouldn't want little Oppie taking checks from the Germans or the Russians, now would you? But then things began to turn against Oppenheimer. In December 1953, President Dwight Eisenhower ordered that a blank wall be placed between Dr. Oppenheimer and any secret data. Oppenheimer was suspected of being a communist spy. He argued he was never interested in politics and economics. Oh no, Oppenheimer, what you doing? I told you not to take the check. Trust me, those rubles ain't gonna be worth much in a couple years. He apparently wasn't even aware of the stock market crash of 1929 until after the fact. However, he started connecting with left-leaning groups in the 30s and 40s after falling for Gene Tatlock. Yeah, you gotta be careful with who you get involved with, man. That's all I'm gonna say. And trust me, those Russian planted spies were pretty popular back in the day. In 1936, friends introduced Oppenheimer to the grad student who was studying psychology at Stanford. Tatlock was extremely involved with politics. She was a member of the Communist Party of America and supported many left-leaning causes. Oppenheimer inherited hundreds of thousands of dollars after his father's death in the 30s and began supporting left-wing efforts, such as the Loyalists in the Spanish Civil War. Oh no, Oppie, bro, what you doing? I thought you were cashing checks. You're the one writing them. Someone's acting a little sus. They had a passionate relationship and were together for several years, coming close to marriage but ultimately broke up. He went on to marry Kitty Punning in 1940. She was a Berkeley student and was at one time a Communist Party member. They had two children together. Yeah, so you literally married a communist and then you're wondering why Eisenhower's a little bit sussed out about you? Come on, man, I thought you were supposed to be a genius. He still continued to see his former love and spend a night with Tatlock while working on the secret bomb project in 1943. Oh no, Oppenheimer, what you doing, man? What you doing? Tatlock told him she still loved him. He never saw her again. 
She was a complicated person and is said to have struggled with her sexuality. She also suffered from intense depression and would take her own life in 1944. Damn, talk about not taking a breakup well. Perhaps it was Tatlock's love of the English poet John Donne that compelled Oppenheimer to name the first test of the atomic bomb Trinity, inspired by Dunn's sonnet about a three-personed god. Although Oppenheimer's communist affiliations were clearly known, they didn't stop him from getting hired on to lead the Manhattan Project. The FBI saw no reason to revoke his security clearance when they conducted an investigation in 1944. However, the onset of the Cold War brought renewed scrutiny Right, talk about being desperate. You know it's bad when the U.S. is like, you know what, we know you're a communist, but we need you, so we're gonna look over that fact. Here's a bunch of secret data. The Soviet Union conducted its first nuclear test in 1949, ahead of America's estimates. People within the government were suspicious of Oppenheimer. William Liskin Borden, executive director of the United States Congress Joint Committee on Atomic Energy, had sent a letter to FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover, concluding, more probably than not, J. Robert Oppenheimer is an agent of the Soviet Union. Oh, Hoover was also a tough cookie, yo. If you guys want to look up an interesting historical figure, look up J. Edgar Hoover. That's all I'm gonna say. He didn't back up his claim with any solid evidence. Borden was close to the chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission, Louis Strauss, who hated Oppenheimer. The two butted heads, and Strauss never forgot when Oppenheimer humiliated him at a congressional hearing years earlier. In 1954, Oppenheimer was called before a tribunal of the Atomic Energy Commission to explain his communist affiliations. It was a closed door hearing that lasted four weeks. Four weeks? Damn, that's long, yo. But you know it's also bad when you're held for that long and they still can't convict you? It means they had nothing on him. Oppenheimer maintained that he had not been radicalized by his ex-partner and said his left-wing friends and associations simply gave him a sense of companionship, nothing more. He had never been a Communist Party member himself. Three board members heard his case. By a vote of two to one, they stripped him of his security clearance. Uh-oh. The guy who delivered the verdict was none other than Strauss, who hated him. Oppenheimer was humiliated. Oh, come on, you put literally the guy who hates him? Right. The once powerful scientist lost all his power. The US government no longer trusted the US government's top atomic physicist. His scientific peers were outraged. Einstein quipped that the AEC and Atomic Energy Commission actually stood for Atomic Extermination Conspiracy. Werner von Braun, the chief architect of the Saturn V that got us to the moon, declared, in England, Oppenheimer would have been knighted. By the way, I did a story on von Braun's past as a Nazi scientist, which I'll link in the description. But at least one scientist was pleased with the outcome. Hungarian physicist Edward Teller resented the fact that Oppenheimer resisted working on the hydrogen bomb, which is the more advanced version of an atomic bomb. When President Truman approached the commission in 1949 about building a hydrogen bomb, Oppenheimer opposed it to the anger of Teller. Yeah, so here's the thing, right? Oppenheimer stood by his morals and he was like, guys, you really shouldn't build that, which is fair enough, but they made him pay dearly for it. And the problem is that without people like that, public opinion will never shift. So even though he's right, it's like now 10, 20, 30 years later, his life is pretty much done. And only now the public is coming around and they're like, whoops, sorry. It's really hard to say if it was worth it. The US pressed ahead with developing a thermonuclear weapon anyway, and tested it in 1952 on the Marshall Islands. The H-bomb became Teller's baby. During the Oppenheimer hearing, Teller testified, I would feel personally more secure if public matters would rest in other hands. For his testimony, Teller was shunned by the scientific community for many years. Today, hundreds of declassified pages from the secret hearings have revealed Oppenheimer was not disloyal. The US Department of Energy concludes, it proved impossible to link his lack of enthusiasm for the hydrogen bomb with suspicions of his disloyalty. That's what I'm saying. If it took them four weeks, they had nothing on the guy. Guys, Take note of that, all right? If a hearing goes on and there's no allegations, 
they probably got nothing. Producing another weapon with the potential to be a thousand times more powerful than the atomic bomb was unfathomable to Oppenheimer. He felt the hydrogen bomb was unnecessary and immoral, fearing its use against civilians. He had used his position on the Atomic Energy Commission to lobby for international control of nuclear weapons to avoid a nuclear arms race with the Soviet Union. With his security clearance revoked, he settled in Princeton, New Jersey, where he still ran the Institute for Advanced Study, a research facility for postdoctoral fellows. He lived quietly until President John F. Kennedy invited him to the White House dinner of Nobel Prize winners in 1962. Yeah, the thing is, when you're that good at what you do, even if you've been stripped of your clearance, you bet they're talking to him behind closed doors, being like, hey, Oppie, what do you think about this? His little mates calling him around like, hey man, I've got this physics problem, I'm not quite sure how to fix it, what do you think? So via his connections, I'm sure he still had a very good idea of everything that was going on. Oppenheimer never won a Nobel Prize himself, though he was nominated for the prize in physics three times. When the Kennedy administration offered him a new trial to potentially get his security clearance back, he declined. Yeah, because he knew they had nothing on him to begin with. He's like, dude, I'm not going to subject myself again to this Fugazi Fugazi <laughs> bullshit just to get publicly humiliated for the second time. Nah, -uh, no thanks. Even though this time probably they were going to clear him. It's still just, it's a bad look. I respect them for that. Further evidence that the government was warming up to him came in 1963, when President Johnson awarded him one of the highest scientific honors bestowed by president, the Fermi Award, which comes with $50,000 tax-free. In response, Oppenheimer said, I think it is just possible, Mr. President, that it has taken some charity and some courage for you to make this award today. Two years later, in 1965, Oppenheimer was diagnosed with throat cancer. He had been a notorious chain smoker all his life. The New York Times once described him as thin as the wisps from his chain smoked cigarettes or pipes. I mean, he had a lot on his mind. It kind of adds up that he would be a chain smoker. On February 18, 1967, he died at his home in Princeton. He was 62 years old. His wife took his ashes to the island of St. John in the U.S. Virgin Islands, where he lived for several months of the year, and spread his ashes in the sea outside of their home, in an area known today as Oppenheimer Beach. The 20th century marked a new age in which the very existence of humankind was threatened. I think that's very sweet and very romantic. Well done. That threat is more real than ever today with fears that Russia could use nuclear weapons in Ukraine. North Korea's missile launches in October were a simulation to wipe out South Korean targets, according to state media. The doomsday clock warns we are getting closer to destroying our world. Here's the thing, right? As long as we have these things around, all it takes is one guy to go a little bit off the rails and be like, hmm. Beep. That's the risk we're taking, because we just can't figure out how to all get along. But if you would like to get along with the other people on this channel, make sure you hit subscribe. At the beginning of the Cold War, we were seven minutes to midnight. Today, we're a hundred seconds to midnight. And on that note, guys, thank you so much for watching. And Ryder, if you want to hear the story about the guy who survived both atomic bombs, check this video out.